yes. from guinea pig fan art doing that sorry uh there she is the lady <laughs> who yells at me <laughs> hey courtney me not you you're not the lady who yells the <laughs> lady who says recording started That's oh my god knows. i was like wow <laughs> I, yeah, I forgot your voice. name <laughs> Um, we should name her. Nance. She sounds like a. Oh, Nance? Not Nancy. Nance. Nance. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I was going with Tiffany, but Nance is better. Tiffany's so Tiffany. mostly. She's, she's like a mom. She's yeah. like a no nonsense mom. Mm. <laughs> like a Barb, like a Nance. I think a Nance Barb, is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those names where it's clearly short for something, but you never call her the thing. That you don't it's short get to for. the fun part of the name. You only uh, get no. the, the, to the point. <laughs> yeah, hard ass. part of the name. Um, I, uh, I've been, you know, going out and I have my arm out and my new, my tattoo and people keep on looking at it and they're like, oh, what is that? They get all excited because they, I think, you know, it looks like a fresh new tattoo and then they, I tell new them tat. It's, a, it's a possum and they're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. It's the artwork is great. <laughs> I guess we're like really way too logged in because everyone in our corner of the internet and life likes possums yes. now. Yes. Yeah. And I think they don't. I guess they're they're behind the times. Most people in the real world, I think they they don't know that possums are cool yet. But yeah. they'll, they'll get, get there. there. Yeah. Um, they're very clean animals. Hang out with a lot of Midwesterners. Or something. Oh yeah. 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 Who are you hanging out with that doesn't like possums? It's Midwesterners, but, yeah. It's exclusively well, it's Midwesterners. It's like the people at Rite Aid. I don't know. <laughs> wow. It's like the, the people at uh, the Halloween store, you know, the pop-up. Or, um, I love that you're going to the Halloween store. I, mean, I haven't I seen was. you in so long. This is the longest I've not seen you in my yeah, whole life. Rex How are you feeling? Saying, uh, I feel better. I, I had a little bit of a cold. I did do multiple COVID tests and they all came back negative. Thank but, God. Yeah. Um, Courtney, just, how are you feeling? Yeah, how are you feeling? You had This a... is the last day of quarantine. Thank hey. fucking God. Hey. So I was going a little crazy, but I feel like I'm like 90% better. Like, so if that is a real thing, COVID, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, was that, did that hit? You were like Very a COVID hard. denier basically until you got no. it. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney's an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not even true. joking. Like, I was like, should I get a booster? That seems like, you know, and then like it had come out that everyone can get boosters like the day after I got COVID. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I don't want to like take it from someone. You know that like weird right, thing you right. tell yourself? Mm -hmm. And I've never regretted anything more. Having COVID sucked. I did sleep a lot though. And that was nice. I got the booster like, days. A, uh, like a week before you got COVID because I had the J and J, so I was able to get it. Right, earlier, right, right. My right. vaccine sucks. <laughs> 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 I got the bad vaccine, so they're like, "Here you go. You can get the booster right away." Yeah, but, yeah. That's... I think that's what saved me from like Danny being around Danny and stuff. Danny too. was hanging out with our friends when I texted him, "I have COVID, so you do." <laughs> oh Jesus! But he then like, his admin test was uh, positive, but his his in the office test was negative was negative yeah but he definitely has COVID. he can't smell still yeah no he i think he like <laughs> had like the beginning of it or something yeah no yeah who it knows was... what a mystery what a, well, thank yeah. god it didn't spread farther than it did i mean yeah the circumstances. um if all of our if our friends had gone it i would have felt so bad but yeah. also like who goes danny was sick oh i shouldn't i shouldn't no, but I won't he do was that. also he was also like <laughs> outside. I mean, yeah, at least yeah. when I saw him, I know he saw our other friends at a writing meeting, and yeah, oh, yep. Well, <laughs> no I'm one got it. Nobody got sick. <laughs> to um, the many COVID deniers in our audience, of which I know there are thousands upon thousands, thousands. it's real. It's, it's really important. real. Not smelling is uncanny. It's so yeah, weird. Like I'm I so... went around and smelled like incense, like, like put it into my nose, basically. And Tried to do a COVID not test a with an incense. Yes, and not a, not a smell in the world. Went to every Damn. floral candle I had. No smells, perfume, nothing. So things you just, you straight up can't smell anything or things just smell off? No, I smelled nothing. Jesus, God. I'm, I'm getting my, it was so weird. I was is, like, it, is it coming back? I think so. I mean, Oh my I God, this is going to be so things. fun for you. Like you're going to like rediscover exciting. smell. Yeah. Well, like, I was like, you know what? If I was going to lose a sense, smell would be the one I gave up. 
I'm not going to lie, smells whatever. You know, I'm not someone that pauses to smell the flowers, though I do love a perfume. Oh, I, I have love to say, pausing to smell the flowers, actually. Not having to light incense because I don't know that my house house smells gross was lovely. I was like, wow. Silver lining. Silver but, lining. But maybe you'll have like a new appreciation for the gross no, I smell will. now, you know? I was you'll very be excited. Like, oh, this gross smell is actually lovely. I if I can smell something. Hmm. That's a really bad choice. Of- <laughs> so we're all recording now, right? Anyways, yeah, yeah we are recording. recording. We're recording. Yep. Just Everyone want to make sure that we're getting this primo this fire content. content. You know, yeah. People need to know that the real, the hard hitting news, and one of it is Courtney's recovered from the pandemic. And yeah, was, and you didn't get nice. to see Rex while she was in town. Oh my god, that was, that was sad. so. Yeah. And that was like the peak of my sickness. So I was like, I remember like waking up like. Rex, hello. <laughs> like, you sent me the like world's most sadness. abject text. It was just like, Rax, my friend, oh, I am God. going to die today and I'm not going to see you while you're in town. And Things I... didn't look good when I when I, I was know. peak sick. Got to tell yeah. you, I was like, this is it. This is my life now. I will never smell or be awake. Um, yeah. Anyway. Oh, and then I had a few friends recently who texted me that they had COVID. I think it's it's coming. There is a back. there is a peak. Yeah. There's yeah, a peak happening a bump, right now. I had another friend text me that they had COVID, and I so I checked again, and I was like, nope. And so. Yeah, and I luckily. didn't even know I didn't have the exposure notifications on my phone, or maybe I did, but I didn't get an exposure notification until days after I got a positive COVID test. Those have like, been kind of unreliable. I, is I that found. me exposing? Did I expose myself? Like, I don't know. I got an exposure be. notification when you got sick. Nice. That means so we were I with think each that other. Was, yeah, that was you. Because uh, we had seen like each other the week before. I like that they send it to me just in case. I hadn't seen you that recently, though, because you kept on no. canceling on me. Um, and that was good. Whoa. Good job. Whoa. <laughs> All right. Um, now that you're feeling better, we're going to do just like friendship <laughs> referendum. <laughs> we're not I actually talking you. about Taylor Swift today. <laughs> I still have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the COVID. I'm still cold. coughing. And we're allowed to see our pa- my parents according to the CDC. Press? Well, they would know. Press? They would know. The contact tracers, at least, there. Yeah, yeah. That's what they say. That's what okay. they say. Mm-hmm. Science is. That's did you get a haircut cool. or did you cut your I hair? I cut my own hair. It looks oh. really cute. Yeah, it looks really you. cute. It looks better without headphones, I will say. And this is day two curl. Mm-hmm. But it's very, look at, oh, I'm just going to take them off really quick. Yeah. That's adorable. Oh, so you can't cute. can't even hear us. We could say it looks terrible. Yeah, I love it. It looks awful. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's my hair looks like I have a little T-Swift vibe. Back. And that's what I, I was think thinking. So. That's yeah, what I was, was going to say. You have like an yeah. early T-Swift vibe. Uh, she does she always have curls. day two curls. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've she noticed does. that. I feel like she invented like the qua- the perfectly quaffed curl. Remember, like she started with curly hair, like Courtney curls, mm-hmm. and then she she transitioned into a is this natural or is it not? Right, kind of natural right. phase. That's kind and of her whole vibe. Now that's like is this natural or is it not? Right. Yeah. Oh my God. Whoa. Insights. The hair can tell you everything <laughs> about a person. That's so true. <laughs> Don't even oh. bother getting to know someone. Wow. Just no, take a judge yeah. them by their hair. Yeah. I used to say that about shoes. But now I wear no. It's hair. You're it's mature hair now, now, so it's yeah. hair. Every moving year, on now. Uh, let's introduce the pod. Oh yeah. Uh, hi hi oh everybody. <laughs> I can't wait to see what kind of power struggle ensues <laughs> between the two of you today. It's been really fun to watch that play out over the past few weeks. <laughs> sure, it's been <a> delightful. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun for me where I'm sitting because I'm always first. And uh, on that note, welcome to Low Culture Boil, the trash podcast about trash culture hosted by three trashy babes. I am your host, Rax King. Cool, we're (laughs) doing- Why are you talking? (laughs) Power play, baby. (laughs) Okay, fine. I'm your COVID survivor, second host, Courtney K. Rawlings of Gal Board fame. Hello. And I am your third host, the winner of that power struggle. <laughs> you did win. Yeah, you won that heartily. That was Thank you. impressive. Thank you. But we're not Thank here you. to talk about how. Why Amber's are you really so uncomfortable with silence? Uh, to quote one of the greatest artists of all time. If Which you're not artist? quoting Taylor Swift. I'm not. I'm not quoting Taylor and her Swift. Speak Now album. Um... I really thought that was Taylor <laughs> Swift. That sounds like something she would say. 
No, that's Alanis Morissette. Uh, okay. That's pretty close. That's kind of yeah. close, though. Yeah, close, I'm, close. I'm calling that one for but Taylor Swift. But today we are not talking about Alanis Morissette. We are talking about Taylor Swift, and she is hot right now. She's, she's been hot. hot. Right. She's been hot for a long time. Uh, she's she's hot, been hot, in the news red. recently, yes. and so it kind of brought her up to the top of our brain. And also, it's fall, and we have like, you know. Christian she has a very autumn girl. She fall, has like fall vibe. Yes, like, she does. She always like dresses like it's fall. Yeah. It's always fall. Yeah, when you're rising like a phoenix. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that's what? such that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm back and better than ever, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so we just wanted to to get into her. I mean, she's been a she's been famous like our entire adulthood. She is about yeah. all of our ages. She's two years younger than me. I think like two years older than you guys, something like yeah. that. Um, and so she's right in between. And she's always gone for her fan base has always been just slightly younger than her, um, which is really, you know, the smartest way to sell music. Anything, but, really. You want people who are a little younger than you. You don't want your fans to start dying out before you do. I yeah. Think is, is the logic and, there. <laughs> Yeah, and you always look cool to the people right. just slightly younger than you are. Right. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about her. Let's talk about how she started, how she got famous. Uh, let's talk about her her origin story. I mean, she originally started in country music, right? Yes, and she did. Her like her first hit was called Tim McGraw. Yeah, I did not know that. Me like, neither. I, don't I was know thinking how it was the song know. about Romeo and Juliet. That's love the first story, story I ever heard of One of the best songs in history. Whatever the fuck it's called. I'm sure it's called it's Love Story. It's a love story, <laughs> baby, just say yes. Yeah. Anyways, Go I ahead. love her. Um, no, you're right. So she started as country. She was like a karaoke star kind of thing. Like her parents were like, she started writing songs like really young. And I know this because I did watch the documentary, Miss Americana. Good. And uh, there's a lot of film uh, 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 cinematic, cinematic proof <laughs> that she, uh, you know, was a young writer. Yeah, she's like um, nine years old, and she's like, um, "I wrote this song yesterday," and then she's yeah. playing the guitar, and it's really. And cute. she was very into country music. It was kind of funny. She, she did technically grow up on a farm. She grew up on a Christmas tree farm. Uh, how idyllic is that? A Christmas tree farm with yeah. horses. Like that's why she has the fall vibe. You know, so she had like this perfect country background. Like I'm just, I came up from the bottom singing karaoke, uh, you know, on my Christmas tree farm. Then my parents moved out to old Hickory Lake, which is where my dad lives. Shout out to Brian, um, oh. outside of Nashville. <laughs> and it was all because they like, they were able to do this mostly because the Christmas tree farm was just for funsies, basically. Like they didn't make yeah. a lot of cashish. It was no. what her parents got into after making a lot of money in finance and then basically like being like, all right, cool. Now we have a lot of money. And Both of her right. parents worked in finance and yeah, they wanted their kids to have sort of an idyllic uh, childhood. And so they moved them to a Christmas tree farm. She was horses. like a private school kid. Like, I mean, it's kind of funny because I never knew any of this until very recently. Like, I didn't know that she was born wealthy. And I don't know why that like really changed things for me. But I guess it makes a lot of sense. Like, not many people are able to, you know, invest in their kids' bizarre, right. you know, singing talent show. <laughs> you know, yeah, whatever that's something skills. that I'd spent a lot of time thinking about while like researching for this episode is uh, because I, I had known about her background for a while and not that I hold it against her, but yeah. I do look at her career, which is impressive as hell. Any way you cut it, she's been crazy prolific. She's a really accomplished songwriter. And it does make you think like, is she this accomplished because she's especially gifted or is she this accomplished because she was able to make these massive investments in her career at a super young age, much younger than the majority of people are able to even think about. And, you know, she had all this money going into her career and her parents would like take her to karaoke competitions on the weekends. They were mm -hmm. just as yeah. invested as she was. Like, what could any of us do if we had that degree of investment in us as you know, creators and also as brands, because it looks to me like the branding started happening 
very right early away. on very yeah. early on like before she even had her first record deal she already had a website and a myspace page and fans i mean that was like sort of of the era a lot of pop stars of that time were already like building their own brand there was soundcloud taking off like people had a fan base before they got record deals which right. there um, were no more record labels taking chances really they they wanted like a known quantity yeah which is uh, yeah. In a way, like the way that like women pop stars like framed it at the time was like that they're taking back control, that they get to like frame themselves um, more independently. Uh, but on the other hand, like you are responsible for building your base before you even have any sort of help. And that does lend itself more to someone with a wealthier background, someone who has parents who can help them build that base before uh, a manager or anyone else can get on the scene. And yeah, I do think that's that's a privilege. I was 100%. trying to figure out 100% like having your parents be able to finance or put like I just never did activities. I, I took sewing classes for a hot second at Joanne's Fabrics. Best mm -hmm. thing I ever did. Um, That's pretty like, tight, actually. I always it was wanted really to cool. I lived yeah. walking jo distance to Joanne's. Yeah. And I've wanted to do it again ever since. I made a Tweety, a really dope Tweety Birds shirt. Oh, Anyways, yeah. um, that, those were my skills. But I was thinking about with songwriting in general, going to a really nice private school where she quote, you know, it, it mattered what kind of designer bag you brought to your like, middle school basically yeah. you know that gives someone the education to do something like learn to song right right like she's pro she is also able to play a lot of different instruments ukulele piano guitar obviously um etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. it's like those kind like uh, being able to develop those kinds of skills it's kind of like old Weimar like uh, you know mm. royalty only get that kind of treatment in right. my head at least you forget that you know so many people grow up with um so many tutors coming to the house and stuff like that to be able to develop that. I think that obviously she's incredibly talented. Obviously. And I think the yeah. branding, like, you know, coming from like a quote unquote wholesome private school life and having the country music thing where I think she was really like uh, dedicated to that and country music as a culture, at least then, not anymore, it's been able to slime up a bit. But at the time, especially women in country music were like, so the pinnacle of Christian goodness. You know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think like the um, the Dixie Chicks got in trouble because they like were po um, political and they said one two thousand two about Bush. Yeah, they said <laughs> yeah. one thing about Bush, and they were like canceled on the country music scene. They were like done. Like actually, like it really hurt them. Like which is why she hard. did yeah. not say anything. She oh, wait, oh my god on okay so. I will not recommend this documentary. I thought it was one of the most. I started watching things. it. I got to say, I stopped watching it. it I was like, like very okay, biased. Not like <laughs> and She's I don't so mind controlling She's over her image. Insane. I mean, after like a decade and a half of having her image controlled for her by these mm -hmm. like highfalutin branding consultants and whatnot hired by her parents. I mean, she's got this like classic rich kid paranoia of being found out, I think. And she says very little. And what she says is clearly, you know, she's she's witty and she's intelligent and interesting to listen to, but also very careful in a way that is easy to pick up on, I think. And uh, she just doesn't want to ever say something that isn't perfectly in line with how she wants to be perceived, which makes sense. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very millennial, too. I mean, it's it a rich is, girl, yeah. but it's also very millennial because we right. all had to, like, build our own sort of brand right sure. i just i have to say not when i was like okay so one of the um the op one of the opening scenes that also was written about in one of the articles we read um is her going to look at one of her old diaries and on the cover it says um uh you know my, like, life, my life my, my career, career <laughs> my dream my dream my reality she was like right. definitely like doing like if you say it can happen it will which like it manifesting. did so. yeah <laughs> she was manifesting she had but a dream it's board so true. i did not think about my quote-unquote career when i was a 13 year old well That's this comes truly crazy to be that high on your priorities list this comes yeah. from being in a wealthy family like this comes from her parents her parents are very driven they already had like scaled to this level and so then they're able to help and focus on their daughter to scale to the next level which is a lot of pressure but it's also a lot of help and they um they like 
did certain things like they, they put her in private school. They moved to this farm. They also named her Taylor because it's a gender. Oh my God. I saw name. that. That was so interesting. Yeah. yeah. They named her they Taylor. They thought she was going to be in, in finance as well. Right. They in, wanted in the her corporate to... world somewhere. Yeah. They're like, if you're climbing the corporate ladder, it's better to have a business card that, you know, you don't know. It could be a man. It could be a woman. Um, and not have your name sort of get in the way, which, right. you know, is just to be named with the thought of your career in mind is pressure. So bizarre, dude. That's yeah. weird. That's strange. weird pressure. To... And I think this all goes into like what we were talking about, which is that she does have a very curated image and it begins in this like these very formative moments, like coming out of the womb and being named Taylor so that. Uh, you're on your business card. No one would know if you're a girl. Right. Yeah. What a like, crazy way to think imagine. about your baby. So weird. I like so gender. Weird. I've like thought about my baby in the future and I've like, I like gender non-specific names. I just think they're like cute and like tomboy or like, you know, like cute and like dandy, like gender bending. I think it's like fun and like gives yeah. you a person a lot to play with, but I wouldn't think about their business card. No. I think like, that's it's funny they were like hardcore weird. hashtag you know like lean in feminist before in 1990 or whatever, or mm-hmm. 1989 1989 duh, duh she has an duh. album named it you should know <laughs> um in 1989 like who i can't i mean first of all her mom must have been and they're very close still to this day like her and her mom um you know, a hard fluting, like I'm, you know, a business gal. And I think that was just so much of her identity that it became her daughter's identity too. I mean, yeah, to be an eighties finance bro as a lady, um, I assume was an identity, you know, had to be an identity in order to even get into the Oh my God. Like, Imagine know, those world. shoulder pads. Imagine all, <laughs> all I was doing when I looked at her, I was like, I can see the shoulder pads. I see yeah. them. Yeah. It, I can see the wheelbarrows of cocaine. I mean, that's what I think when I think <laughs> 80s finance, bro, is I think that the Swifts were doing fat rails of coke constantly. And you know that's what? Right. Power to them. But I do think- And they were like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to buy a Christmas tree farm and we're going to raise yeah. our kids on it. And we're going to go- We're going to name our daughter Taylor so that it looks good <laughs> on her business cards. Yeah, no, I, that's kind of how I see it. But I do yeah. think that like, to an extent, she was born to have this killer instinct, not specifically for songwriting, which is where she ended up and where she shows so much skill, but it's really a business person's killer instinct that you yeah. see like writ large throughout her career. I mean, how many other artists would even think to do all the finagling that she successfully did to escape the major record label and escape Spotify and, you know, sign to an indie and still have control of her masters. Like, I don't even know what all that stuff means. Yeah, I know. And I'm sure that's true of many recording artists too. (laughs) She had a deal with Sony and then she like, she, uh, once that deal let up, she left Sony to go with um, an independent label. I can't remember the name. Which is hilarious for Taylor Swift. (laughs) Yeah, but she knew she saw this guy who left yeah. who left his like big Scott record Borchetta. Cover. What's what's his name? His name's Scott Borchetta. Scott Borchetta, thank you. And she was like, he's starting his own record label. I'm gonna get in with him, not because I necessarily like him, but because I can see that getting in with him early means that I have a lot of power. And yeah. so I can like make a bigger deal. I can right. get I can do better in negotiations. And Wait. that worked for her. I was thinking of her in terms like in comparison to another big star right now, Britney Spears. And you think about different, like they're both basically child stars. So like, obviously Taylor Swift doesn't, I think also because her parents are already wealthy. Right. And so that they're just basically fueling her dream. And then they don't need her money. They don't need it. Yeah. They're not like thirsty for it. That's a difference in career minded kids. There are career minded kids who are career minded, um, because their parents instilled that in them and there are career-minded kids whose parents need them to be successful lest they starve mm-hmm. okay you know and those are very very different dynamics for a family and someone like Britney Spears was her family's basically sole provider yeah where somewhere like Taylor Swift they were like good that's great you made a million dollars we have that too invest uh, that or buy yourself a house yeah. or like have fun with it which is I mean Obviously, the Britney Spears path should not be inflicted on anybody. You shouldn't have to be a cash cow for so many people in order to pursue what you love and what you're good at. Like the Taylor Swift route 
should be available to anybody who wants to create something. I mean, imagine the art we'd have. It'd be so cool. Uh, well, it'd I, be great. I was also but thinking, like, just like the age that they got into it. So even if that she's also doing is... karaoke stuff, her parents say she got the, you know, say she got a deal when she was like nine, which is like insane, right? But like, say like something like this happened, like what happened with the, um, What's it called? The Musketeers kids? The Mickey Mouse you know? Club. The Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah. The you know, Musketeers kids. Her parents would be like, well, it's a little early. We don't actually need you to make that money. And like, it could fuck with your head. You know, that's something yeah, that true. I think a person who's naming their kid Androgynous Taylor might think about. Where, uh, you know, any other parent would be like, you're going to pay me $300,000 for my kid to dance in a tutu. Obviously, I'm going to, you know, sign off on that because you really up. don't yeah. have a choice. But if your parents are already millionaires, you don't don't have to put your kid's mental health up for sale and just hope for the best in the same That's way. That's such a good point. I, I really hadn't thought so clearly about like, I mean, yeah, of course, the, the Britney versus Taylor dynamic like those are two very different kinds of pop stars to be but it's also two very different sets of stage parents and I think you could argue that both were stage parents but one was in a position to give their child Taylor Swift the support particularly the financial support of not depending on your money and you really don't see that in the Britney Spears story what's really missing is support and of course as we all know Unlike Taylor Swift, Britney Spears had a very public, very significant breakdown. Yeah. yeah. Where and she Taylor was um, had the wherewithal she... to disappear when she had a breakdown. She literally was like, I'm going to go to my $20 million Tribeca apartment and just relax, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Which she is could afford the much to better do that. way to have a breakdown. I would yeah. love she to have had a mental health like day, that. But her family also wasn't like stalking her to like, where are you? You need to make more money. Um, yeah. Like, even though her parents now are like very plugged into almost every facet of her life, like they are, they are making money off Taylor Swift, but it's a little, I do think it's a little different, but I was also thinking just like kinds of mental breakdowns. Like I think Britney Spears, you know, she didn't get to finish her, her education in a real way. She didn't have any moment in her adult life where she wasn't famous or could walk away at any time. Um, because so many people were banking on her, like, I can only imagine what that does to like your ability to create your own image, right? Like Taylor yeah. Swift has, this is what I was trying to say. All right. She doesn't like, have control. She was able to put real stakes into the, and control her image and being like, yeah. I want to be famous on these terms. Right. Taylor Where Swift I don't was... think Britney Scott that she was a sex, you know, a sex star the second she came out. Yeah. yeah. And she was a little bit older and she was like more controlled by her label and her manager. Like they were really shaping her. Like they, She wasn't like a karaoke star who built her own base, who had her own website, who like was making YouTube videos. She was like really like a, like an unknown before the label found her. And they, um, then they like made her into this image. So it's like her like fitting, being like fit into this image and then being controlled by her family on top of it um, that are is really like just a lot of pressure. Like you couldn't see the real her. She was like being like pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. You mean Britney? Yeah. Britney Spears. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Taylor, on the other hand, like got to decide what she I mean, she had career written on her diary. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, if someone's career minded that early in life, they have a sense for their brand. And Mm -hmm. it's, it is, and we'll get to this, of course, like her being like the quintessential millennial insofar as, and again, I think she's a little old for this. Like I was not raised this way, but I saw kids a little younger than me raised this way and some kids my age, but like, I was not aware at all of my, of my career future or all these things. And I think I was kind of weird actually in that way. My parents didn't care if I went to college, like they didn't care at all. You know, they were like, just do you girl. (laughs) I was like, okay. But like, that's not a you know, a childhood that people get any, like no one is raised like it's the 1970s and you're guaranteed a good life anymore because you're not. Um, Most people are guaranteed a pretty bad life. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> shit life. Very unstable <laughs> life is what's in store for most She's of us. She's like, I mean, also, this is like old now. It's so millennial to talk about this, but like back when the millennialification of everything, like avocado toast, blah, started Um, was the first time that statistics came out about like, no one is going to be, you know, this generation is not going to be wealthier than their parents. Actually, they're going to be significantly in a worse position. And Taylor is one of these 
people Few. who goes well beyond. Yeah. Like literally from her career mindedness and dedication from the age of 12, um, <laughs> to writing beautiful music and being successful and being a sweet, sweet girl, um, was able to really pave her own way. And that's the most American story ever. And uh, you sound amongst like, millennials. You sound like Lori on Shark Tank right now. <laughs> a little bit. Who's Lori? <laughs> uh, she's a shark from Shark Tank. You know, she's like, this is, or you sound more like Mark Cuban. He's the, always the one Thank who says you. like, um, <laughs> that's, you know, this is like the American dream. You know, you're like the American dream. She uh, really is. And it's quite bizarre. Yes, in, but uh, she had, the world. yeah. I mean, she had. No, no, no. What I'm saying is obviously no one gets the, it's very rare to actually come from nothing. Like Johnny Cash, uh, you know, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. You can't come from nothing. Like I can't think of anyone who's famous, who's not a Cardi child B. of a Cardi famous. Cardi B, yeah. Cardi, oh, and she's of course a Bernie bro. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, most of those people, you know, not born poor. Um, yeah. And I think that, I mean, that's what's led to this more anodyne feeling celebrity culture, I think, mm -hmm. because like celebrity culture now versus celebrity culture 20 years ago. I mean, it's everything is so PG-13 now. Everything is like Marvel movies and pop stars who are super careful to never ever say the wrong thing. And I think that, I mean, part of it is people don't wanna get canceled and people don't yeah. wanna get yelled at by the masses who have more of a voice now. But I also think we're all on this never ending quest to optimize ourselves. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're terrified of saying the wrong thing because it could put a real dent in our careers. And we're, you know, terrified of being photographed in an unflattering way because that's the picture they show for you on, you know, everything for the rest you of your life. Missing. So, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. you're always thinking like 10 yeah. steps ahead in this very paranoid way that is absolutely designed to keep you unhappy and striving because. And you see some of that with Taylor Swift. I mean, she talks in interviews about like, she doesn't really like to relax. She doesn't like to sleep too late because what if that's the day that she was supposed to wake up in the morning and write a great song? And it's like, you know, you do write a lot of great songs, but also, holy shit, what a way to live. That's yeah, are you that. living? Are, are you living? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I was thinking about all of this with the article that you sent us, Courtney, the new rules, the destruction of the female pop role model. It was the Guardian yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and it was talking about all these female pop artists who had this like rebellion against managers and record labels and taking back their image and like taking back control over their image. And, um, and I was like reading it and I was, I, it's just mm, like, yes, that's, that's good to have that power, but it, it kept on making me think about like the way that um, women fought to be in the workforce, right? And, and you're now like, look at us. <laughs> like now look at us. Like okay, yes, all these women have now control over their image, but they're still like hounded to be perfect, and they could be like canceled at any second. Now they are just like directly at the whim of their audience and the public in general, rather than like reporting to, you know, a label or a manager who's like shaping their image. Like that's still, the responsibility is still there. It's just now they have to do it themselves rather than right. having someone else do it for them. And anybody new coming onto the scene has to like build that image and base before they even get any like attention at all. It's like, um, like, mm, did we, did they make a wrong turn there in, in choosing that? I mean, I don't know of any other way forward. Well, in the, another article, the Rolling Stone article, for instance, um, the writer of Vanessa, very difficult last name to say, Brigodiadis. <laughs> I don't know how to say your last name. I'll say Vanessa G. Um, kind of is alluding to what you're talking about too, which is almost like, in comparison to the young pop stars that we all quote unquote, like learned lessons from basically mm -hmm. who taking back their image meant, you know, um, a kind of uh, a very odd feminism of like hypersexualizing yourself and yes. going out drinking. And, um, this writer refers to that as to people like Taylor Swift as a backlash against the pantyless TMZ culture of the earlier decade, which proved to be career killing for people like Lindsay Lohan, um, or Paris Hilton or someone like that. I mean, it's true that 
not only was she raised, was she born Taylor and out of the womb, you know, told that career is everything. She was also told to look at these hoes who right. are the subject of intense derision um, because they didn't, you know, keep their politics to themselves or their pants, you know, their pusses to themselves or something like this. And yeah, but weren't they going to be canceled feminism. no matter what? Like, right. weren't, isn't like a female pop star's career only so long? Like, aren't they going, isn't it going to come to an end no matter what they do? And she kind yeah. of learns that, right? But she's still, to kind the, of, like, she yeah. kind of learns that with the Kanye thing. Like, uh, anything can happen, you know, like, she, it seemed like that did really affect her career. I remember when she went like missing for a year or something like mm-hmm. this. Um, but she's still to this day is obsessed with, again, this like very like millennial thing of self-preservation right. of, yeah. of not being too sexual, but being sexual enough of not being too skinny, but being skinny enough. Even how she talks about her, I'm sorry if I'm going off track, but her eating disorder in the movie is like, well, the thing was, is like, I was like too skinny. Um, and that was because I didn't want to be fat, but then, um, I would, you know, I'd be like if I gained weight, then I was not uh, skinny enough. Like she like, she's it's like kind of an eating disorder and more like obs- like obsession. It's um, optimization. Which is, it's just she, another field of optimization. It, literally, I can see things in her head like, okay, what? I don't even want to talk about my own disordered ob- obsessive eating in a way that's not already palatable. So she sells right. us this kind of story about her eating disorder in a way that's been told a million times. Mm-hmm. And you know, also like, in a way that heavily and- implies that it's behind her. When she does yes. talk about unpleasant things, I find that she strongly prefers to talk about them once she either feels they're behind her mm. or can convincingly say they're behind her. Wow. Which, Which is, I mean, is reasonable. Like nobody wants to tell the fucking New York Times all about the breakup they're going through right at that moment, of course. But like the the degree to which that seems to be her career's guiding principle is to you know, not talk about anything controversial unless it's already over and you've learned from the mistake. That's just more optimization. That's just more like cl- rounding off the corners, the hard corners yeah. of one's brand. It can feel disingenuous. Uh, it often well, does, I think. Yeah. And I'd say that as someone who, you know, whenever I see her interviewed or whatever, I find her very likable. I but find it's, her it's, very likable. Yeah. It's Absolutely. so clear that there's so much of the story we're never going to get. And she doesn't really... I, I don't get the sense that she's giving us that message on purpose. Like I get the sense that we're being told to fuck off. Mm-hmm. I get the sense that we're just seeing a very well polished, well lacquered persona that just isn't conducive to getting the hard stuff. You, you're never going to get the hard information. Well, she would never, she would never tell us to fuck off because she is very aware that her parasocial relationship with her audience is what makes her money. It's what makes her so powerful. It's like the thing that she brings. She definitely developed that really early on having become famous, like pop star famous. So once she left the country scene exclusively and became pop star famous, social media had just blown up. She still uses her Tumblr to this day. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> she loves Tumblr. Like, she's, and I'm like, that so makes sense. Like her, like there's something about blonde hair quaffed like that and Tumblr that like go hand in hand. No, for sure. Um, I don't and, know. Like, I just autumn. think of porn whenever I think of Tumblr. I don't. Well, R.I.P. Not one. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> But I actually, I, this is just a hypothesis. Yeah, so I was asked, the reason I was so excited to talk about Teespos, but I've always been a fan, like not like, you know, parasocially or at all. Like I didn't even You're know she had a, a new album. <laughs> I was not a Swifty, but I was like, yeah, that's, I love singing karaoke to a T-Swift song where everyone screams like a psychopath, you know? And she encourages people to sing in her concerts. Like she like really wants them to sing along. And I think that like adds to the parasocial like element. People are oh, like, no, like yeah, right she's there like, with her. So the difference that I, it, a hundred percent and like that she developed that is, it doesn't seem, okay, here's, let me try and put this in, in as clear as can be. Okay. I think why people like her, even though she is so clearly manicured is because her, um, lacquerization to borrow from racks or like her like person her like creation of her own persona, like is her persona, like yes. her real self is in like, and I mean, like, and this doesn't even make sense, right? Like there's no fucking real whatever, but like her most authentic self is in creating a uh, self is in self-preservation is in creating an image. And that's, I think what we'll see with Jen 
Zers, right? Zoomers, yeah, who are like rebelling against the millennial um, persona, which is a genuine, earnest, I know you're looking at me. And so I'm always going to be looking at myself. Kind of yeah. So Whereas the like, so millennials, up. if millennials are like, okay, I know that I'm being looked at all the time. So I am going to like create my brand and like form myself in the specific way where I can be looked at. And I know you're going to see this version of me. Gen Z took it and was like, you know what? Don't fucking perceive me. Like, stop stop doing they that also, like look like, away i'm gonna make it like planning. i'm gonna make it unfun to look at like do not look at me yeah see to me both of those approaches are fundamentally incompatible with the role of a celebrity and i yep. mean she hasn't really crashed and burned yet but for me there is only a matter of time because like the whole point of celebrity the whole function of it is just fuel for spectacle, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a cornerstone of the spectacle, I think, is the, are these highly public, highly look atable figures, you know, basically tap dancing for our attention. Like that's the whole point of celebrity. And there's this whole new crop of celebrities who need the money, right? That comes with being a celebrity because that's how you get rich in the entertainment industry. And they probably like some of the attention, but they're also hyper aware that the ax could fall at any time, the other shoe could drop, and they could say something that gets taken out of context. They could, you know, be overheard doing something shitty. It's really only a matter of time because nobody is perfect. And the behavior that we see from them in interviews and profiles and whatnot, it ends up just looking so paranoid to us as viewers yeah. because we know how much of the story we're not getting. Well, I think about, I was looking at our TikTok, T-Swift, how you doing, girl? I'm watching your TikTok. <laughs> um, and thinking about this kind of persona making. And one thing that she does really well is even take her flaws. So there's this very popular um, uh, TikTok right now of Taylor Swift, like showing a picture of her drunk being like, like in like looking totally cute the, the morning, the next day, but showing a picture of her like, totally like her hair's like in front of her face. She can like barely stand up and she's like, LOL, <laughs> I got drunk, you know? And like turning that into like, I'm, I already am aware that this is gonna be taken out of context. And so I'm going to have get ahead of the story. lean in, get ahead of the yeah. story and turn it into a cute joke. Like, yeah, I drank too much and that's very silly. And I'm she's an expert just like diffuser. you. Yeah. She's an expert diffuser. And uh, even in so much of the Miss Americana documentary, she's like, everyone thinks that I'm just like, so you know perfectly a perfect persona that I create that I'm calculating and she's like no 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 I just have an amazing work ethic and like, Whoa. <laughs> she says worth ethic oh I should have taken a tally I just wasn't expecting it because I every time she said it I was like whoa 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 you're talking about trying to come off as non-calculable her most like her most authentic moments are when she's talking about how she's not calculable and clearly calculating them yeah. <laughs> like yeah you know that's bizarre that's like Very a, meta. A truly she talks know, about self-preservation a lot too a work lot. ethic and self-preservation like her like two things that she goes back to and i don't know i think about her with like um when i like first started thinking about taylor swift when you brought her up as a topic i like don't i was never really a fan i think i'm a little bit too old to be a fan of her music i of course there are some breakthrough songs that are like yeah they they get they like hit me because of course they're on the radio and i i know yeah them. but um not a big fan i do see her in the media and i'm like she seems like she's killing it and um, she's yeah. always always there um yeah. but i like thought about her and i was like she is like a woman empire to me and the other woman that i think of as like a woman empire is kim kardashian and yeah, um great comparison yeah and so i look at like them two compared to each other and it's a very much like a madonna whore complex they mm -hmm. both uh, they're very similar i mean it's like a you know they're both wealthy they both were raised wealthy they both like um had this like career like in their path already um but there's um you know kim who has this way of like sharing everything about her life possible like she has a whole reality show about her life um everything is very like out there and forward and transparent and then there's taylor who like holds things close until maybe like a few years after it's done and then might write like a little bit 
like with some Easter eggs in one of her songs. Uh, very like secretive, like holding her personal life close uh, so that she doesn't make any missteps. And it feels like in the information age, those are like the two archetypes. Like that's the Madonna horror complex now. It's like uh, oversharing or, you know, not sharing very much, like keeping it very like calculated and, and meticulous. Um, I would argue undersharing. I would undersharing. argue that, I mean, yeah. she could stand to loosen up a bit. I feel like, as I say, like this degree of undersharing when you're this firmly in the public eye and when your career is all about these deeply personal songs you write, like there's an end of the line somewhere. That that strategy is not going to last forever. It's built. It's got a built-in expiration date of the first moment that you fuck something up. And I think we, oh, yeah. we saw I think that being... come close with the when Kim Kardashian first leaked the phone call, which I know we'll talk about more that, in the next like, episode. But I remember so that. many people being like, yeah. I knew it. I knew she couldn't be trusted. I knew she was hiding something. And I mm -hmm. think we were right that she's absolutely hiding something. But I, I, that whole saga didn't really shake out the way we assumed it would when it no. all came out. But, you know, we, we all kind of, I, I know that I, as someone who doesn't really pay much attention to Taylor Swift, I felt relieved when that happened, not because I'm invested in it and not because I hate her, but because it had just felt like too long without her doing something untoward, without her mm -hmm. making a misstep. And that's not being a person, that it's just not. Yeah. I do, I think I agree that somewhere in the middle is the way to be. Um, I mean, I think there is a plus side to just blasting the media with every single bit of your life possible. Cause then it's like um, finding a needle in a needle stack. You know, it doesn't really matter as much as like right. Kim Kardashian wants to like shock people. It doesn't matter anymore cause everything is out there. But I do think, yeah, she could stand to uh, open up a little bit. Um, it would help. I think like someone like Taylor at this Swift point, not it would be ever send a nude. Yeah. Like you no. know what I'm saying? Like that will never happen. She will never send a nude. No. Um, oh well. You know what I mean? Like because I have friends she's who think always that already asexual, basically. That are like, <laughs> you have Wait, friends who think what? That Taylor Swift is asexual. They think she does not have sex. They're like she does not. It's I think that all her relationships are made up. Um, I just don't see it happening. And I think like. I don't speculate about her sexuality one way or the other. I think what they're seeing, though, is just this meticulousness. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Right. Well, like, remember when that, like, people's um, news were being leaked and, like, and very popularly it became, so not, not the, not um, the November one, like, Greek no, Center. I, I remember what you're talking, it was like, like earlier. It was like, almost 10 years ago and it was yeah. just all these celebrities all at once. The mm -hmm. fappening. But yeah okay like, and we blamed them a little yeah. bit we were like well the lesson here ladies is don't send anyone nudes and never gonna happen sorry yeah. everyone's gonna at, send nudes <laughs> obviously not taylor, no, taylor swift, swift. Everyone else. Isn't. <laughs> and i think this is how she's kept such like a of she stayed so wholesome in the popular imagination even post kanye is like she really wouldn't send a nude and I think that's earnest and genuine because she is, she's not a feminist right at the beginning of her career. And then when she is a feminist, she's like, I'm a feminist because um, Connie called me a bitch and I didn't, he didn't have my permission. And now I'm like going to be a lean in feminist. I'm going to show them that, you know, girls can be cool too. I don't know. Like, I, I can't explain it. It's like, kind well, of it's funny very feminism. wrapped she up in her own Dunham. career. Like yes, it's right. very like her feminism Career focused is, feminism. Yeah. I think she never would have even got to that point in such a public way if she hadn't been the object of such a public takedown. Like I mm -hmm. think she would have never whatever her feminism. politics are privately, again, we're never gonna know, but it was an opportune moment to incorporate this very particular girl power feminism into her image because, you know, it was a way to get the public back on her side and it worked pretty well. I guess okay. like again, so do you want to get into a little bit of like what the the thing was between her and Kanye? Do let's you do that like... next episode, I think. Okay. Because we're, we're um, close to an hour now. Yeah, we are. That's um, true. Uh, by the way, this is going to be a two-parter. So you guys should <laughs> definitely uh, subscribe to our Patreon if you want to get more of the info. Unculturewild. Uh, <laughs> I mean, patreon.com slash <laughs> unculturewild. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Um, so did you, okay, really quick. I just, you know, I don't know if you guys are still in. I'm like fascinated by this like aspect of self-creation and how 
it's both inauthentic and the only way to survive, to preserve and allow yourself to be, I don't know, have the same amount of number one tracks as the fucking Beatles or whatever. Her like, she has like a crazy billboard history. Anyway, but I was thinking of her now on the feminist ilk and compared to someone like Lena, oh, I was gonna say Lena Dunham, no. Um, uh Lana she, Del Rey. she uh she does like uh credit Lena Dunham for her for her uh and it's so identifying obvious that, of course, as a Lana Dunham feminist. was the one who like was like anyways so here's the thing girl I was also born very wealthy and yeah. look at me succeed yeah <laughs> and I'm just like the boys it's gonna be the least self-aware conversation that's ever oh, happened no. probably one of the around. most absurd conversations ever yeah. and also like you know you hindsight is 2020 like i was a 2016 fucking lib fam so everyone Same. falls victim to the crimes of pop culture sure but yeah what i i was just thinking in comparison to someone like lana del rey who recently or has always said i'm not a feminist right okay and that being a subject of people's conversation and then there's like uh, but there is something about lana del rey who of course has also always been criticized for uh kind of overanalyzed like an overproduced um uh like image oh vocal oh no image oh image and then yeah. of course like recently she's kind of gave that up in the last like five years let's say and was like I'm not a feminist blah, blah blah I'm just gonna be like really honest and there is something like you know I think that scared a lot of people away like oh she's not she said she's not a feminist I mean I, I remember not, it being controversial sure. Right. I'm not convinced that it scared anybody away who would have been a super fan regardless. I, I think it's kind of the the same model, <clears throat> excuse me, the same model we see on Twitter all the time where yeah. like if you say something that people get angry at you for and enough people are angry about it, it's going to magnify what you said straight into the brains of people who agree mm -hmm. with you and you'll mm -hmm. end up with like roughly the same fans that you would have had before it's yeah a pretty decent way to drum up attention for yourself yeah i, I well, mean it's yeah. like it's like That's anybody like get a popular podcast yeah <laughs> well and it's like anybody um going to into celebrity you like you talked about rax it's part of the deal like you are sharing yourself you are going to be in the spotlight um for as much love as you are going to get you're also going to get hate like i think the artists and celebrities who are the most successful and become the most well-balanced are the ones who understand that as part of the deal and not not let it affect them so much and she talks yeah. a lot about how she doesn't know how to do that she doesn't oh, know no, how to like... not let it affect her she's very insecure and i know that i'm freezing right now but the video is recording it on my end so i'm gonna keep talking hold on one second again Hey, can you hear me? Oh, there she is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey. Cool. Okay. Yeah, um, can... Sorry, I did. I did keep talking because um, the you. video got it on my end. But um, but yeah, what I'm saying okay, is like, it's um, for the for as much love you get, you get hate as well. And um, yeah. And the people who deal with it the best are the ones who are able to take that in stride. And she talks a lot about how she can't take it in stride. She does not yeah. know how to take it in stride. She has very thin skin. Yeah, which I don't is know why a lot of people can... become famous, I have to say. Thin-skinned people are obsessed with fame. <laughs> yeah, because they feel like it's going to make them happy to have the positive attention. I'm and sure then they realize does. how much negative attention it comes with it. I just feel like, you know, after all these years, it's been over a decade of Taylor Swift mega fame. And I just feel like under those conditions, you have to develop a thick skin. Like, And she hmm. still, to this day, says in interviews that she doesn't have one. And I feel like it's maybe supposed to be like kind of charmingly self-deprecating, but yeah. put on. if it's true, you think like, it's calculated possibly. It, okay. So I don't this fucking is what, care. <laughs> I don't, I think I'm not invested her, enough in Taylor her Swift. Her personality care. is all always already calculating. Like even in her, in the um, documentary, she, her, I assume purposefully is wearing like childlike overalls, like shorts and sitting crisscross applesauce in a business meeting. Mm -hmm. Crisscross yeah. applesauce is how <laughs> she was sitting. And yeah, she, she does that multiple it makes times. Me, I feel very disinclined to get into Taylor Swift's music, even though when I hear her songs on the radio, I like them. Yeah, they're bops, but I, maybe. I just know that I would drive <laughs> myself insane with the degree of calculation that 
that is in her music as well, right? I mean, there's all these songs where for the fans, there are Easter eggs and the liner notes and you can maybe figure out who the song is about if you try really hard. That shit drives me insane. Just, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that homework, no. No, I'm not gonna do a bunch of stuff. Like I, <laughs> well, I'm gonna listen to the music when I feel like it and I'm gonna go fuck myself the rest of the time. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply the music to what's happening in my own life. I'm not listening to it for the story of your life, honestly. Um, well, the, okay, so this is why it just, you know, to wrap up our discussion kind of in a perfect little bow, Joelle Kidd's um, article from 2012 or in The Walrus, Taylor Swift is the surprising face of millennial anxiety. She kind of um, talks about Taylor Swift um, by talking about two literary figures, ladies, if you if you can believe it, Lauren what? Euler ladies and Gia Tolentino. I don't think girls know how to read. I think you better check the article. Yeah. Um, check, that, check that again. Are they gender non-conforming names? Yeah, I mean, you came here from Ramsey's book. She actually fell onto uh, her computer and that's what came out. That's <laughs> so right. She's just a coordinated faller. I'm a great um, faller. <laughs> I'm sorry. She can't, just she falling with style. Sorry. Even her lyrics, which I think we should go into it whenever we can but like her lyrics are always written from this kind of first personal perspective um similar to how Gia Tolentino writes and what Euler says is of course everyone is writing about themselves that's like just the facts like you can't not be writing about yourself because you're writing right. um but there is a very millennial thing this is Euler's argument I don't know if I agree or disagree where you your confessions um become a way of turning the outside world into something about your inner state. Yeah. So this is also She's... very similar to like, like we're all little monads, right? That are yeah. all self-concerned instead of um, understanding that like other people can take up your point of view in right. a very serious and meaningful way. So she writes, Swift, who is known for her confessional lyrics, resembles Euler's hysterical critic in the relentless way she turns her analysis inward. In the film, that's what I watched, Miss Americana on Netflix, don't watch it. The pitfalls <laughs> of the music industry, the pressures of fame and larger social inequalities are discussed only after being filtered through the prism of Swift's persona. What emerges is a sense of Swift, born in 1989, a fact she made a meal off of in 2014, as the prototypical millennial star, one who is eminently aware of the pressures under which her life is constructed but unable to escape them. Swift's work is the product of a millennial life writ large, the need to, as Tolentino puts it in one of her Trick Mirrors essays, always be optimizing. Yes. So it's like, um, so she's talking about this difference between like millennials and writers before them where they, it's instead of um, taking in the, instead of taking your experience and then seeing how it affects the world at large and how you can I, relate with other people, it's the opposite. You see the world at large and then how it affects you. Right. Um, which is like a turning inward, which is very common uh, amongst millennials. Like it is a, well, it's, it's like a, a method. thing where it's we psychologically affect, it's avoidance. It's, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and it's a thing that we've been taught to do. I mean, we can yeah. only like when we try to turn outward and change the world, we hit wall after wall after wall. Like we cannot do anything and it becomes very frustrating. And we are told we are told to go to therapy. We are yeah, told yeah. to fix ourselves. We are told to journal. So we continue to like be like, okay, well, I can't change anything but myself. Like right. be the change I want to see in the world. So like I've got to like turn inward and see what I can do. But it becomes mm -hmm. like just over analysis and, um, and narcissistic and um, yeah. solipsistic. Uh, it, when yeah, it solipsistic like, goes too far. Is yeah. exactly right. I think, I, yeah, I think that uh, right. the, I think that the the fact of our I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off Courtney I'll be quick no, no, no. but I, I do think the fact of our relentless turning inward and of taking the facts of the world and like filtering them through ourselves I think that is very much a function of our lack of control the only thing mm. that we are even able to optimize at this point is ourselves all yeah. we feel we have control over is you know what we're eating what we're wearing what we write in our songs, what we say about our ex-boyfriends. Like it's, there's very little external control even available to us. So to the extent that someone like Taylor Swift is performing an act of avoidance when she writes all mm -hmm. these deeply solipsistic songs, which yeah, I think they are. I mean, to the extent that that's even happening or to the extent that we keep writing autofiction, keep writing yeah. personal essays and, you know, making 
documentaries where we are asking all these questions to some crazy ass subject like it I do think it's a phenomenon I'm not sure I agree with Lauren Euler that it's a fault of any individual I think mm. that if we had more control over the world if we were more comfortably able to affect the world and interact with the world in a meaningful way you know the art would probably follow but we're not all that's left to us is ourselves as subject and right. so we write the hell out of that subject constantly in everything we do we no i agree i think oilers um especially well i mean she's talking about gia tolentino and i she is criticizing tolentino in this way or at least you know using criticism as a method to look at the you know a, otherwise well-regarded um right. publication trick mirrors i similarly i think Euler has a lot of insights, and I think it's a very helpful um, method of looking at Taylor, but also I don't want to think of Taylor Swift as have, being a victim to this, nor as right. being as conniving. I have, in any, in any way you put it, her calculating nature is like nature at this point. And I think that's, if you push Euler a little farther, you know, who are these people who aren't self-cannibalizing? They're the ones who are meta about self-cannibalization. And that's yeah. as far as you can get. Yeah, and within the constraints of our cages, that is as far as you can get. Yeah, you can know you're away. in the cage or something like right. that. And yeah. I always find anything that ends with that is hasn't pushed far enough, right? Like yeah. that always means that there's, there's the smart people and then there's the idiots, right? Um, and that's true. There are small people and idiots, but I don't think like in this particular, um, you know, construction that that Euler is completely correct. I don't have a better answer except for that. Um, I don't think Taylor would be in this position were it not for this positionality to be the one that is inescapable and- um, mm, She's a subject uh, of her time. She lives in a society. She's exactly, a, she's a, a perfect encapsulation of what we all want to do, which is make our image our labor and yeah. our labor our image. Um, yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, anyways, like, that, we fixed it. On that <laughs> yeah. note, um, I do it. think that there is so much more to go into. So, there, oh my God, I'm obsessed with Taylor Swift. I'm like, I'm not a Swifty, but maybe I am a Swifty. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's been part one of Taylor Swift. Uh, or we two, will depends into... on how we were. <laughs> we I love that we on... say that every single time. That's got to be really fun for people listening <laughs> to watch us like work out in real time how we're going to schedule our podcast. This is one of the parts of a two-parter. <laughs> <laughs> this is part one. Uh, we will talk, we'll talk about part two in the next episode and we hope to um, be speaking into your ear holes there. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Cool it, Amber. <laughs> no, no holes. No holes. Um, I'll be the same, bitches. Thanks for listening. We love you. Bye.